All right, let's talk about granulomas. So this is a little extra that I typically don't talk about in class, but because we're recording these lectures, I need to make sure that we have that information, or well, that you have that information. So uh, we're gonna talk about granulomas for just a moment. So imagine for a moment that you have um, bacteria that for whatever reason, your macrophages aren't able to overcome. You know, your, your macrophages, your immune system, they just can't quite beat whatever that bacterial infection is, or maybe it's a fungus, but it's something that your body can't beat. So what we'll do is the, um, the macrophages will join together into a giant multinucleated cell. Now, why is it called multinucleated? Well, because every cell has its own nucleus, and when they join up into the giant megazord, um, so yes, it's like the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. So when they join up to be the giant megazord cell, each of them has its own nucleus. So now this one big cell has multiple nucleuses. So what will happen is this giant multinucleated cell will try and just eat that stuff and then contain it inside itself. So if you think about like a bomb containment unit, containment unit, what you do is you have this really strong metal container, you put the bomb into the container, and then hopefully when the bomb explodes, it doesn't break the container. And that's basically what this is. Our giant multinucleated cells like, okay, let's just kind of eat it and then hold it inside of us and hope we can hold it inside until the person dies of other causes. And then what we'll do is we'll surround this area with macrophages. So you have a layer of macrophages around here, several layers actually, and then supporting those will be a number of T cells. And so the T cells are directing the macrophages to come to this area. And then the last thing we're gonna do is we're gonna cover the whole thing up with collagen and scar tissue, fibrous tissue. And this structure where you've got the middle of the giant multinucleated cell trying to eat the bacteria and then surrounded by macrophages, then surrounded by T cells, and then the whole thing is kind of sewn up with fibrous tissue, scar tissue. That is called a granuloma. And a granuloma occurs when your body can't beat whatever it's trying to fight against. So that's really all you need to know about granulomas. Um, you will have a test question about them, so now you know. All right. I felt like I paused for like a whole minute, and I'm sure it's like half a second. second. It was like a half a second. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go. Now that was my phone. Stop laughing. I'm trying to get the room noise so I can get a nice noise reduction. All right, let's talk addiction for a moment. When I first delivered your addiction lecture, um, I had updated it ever so slightly from previous lectures, but then I realized over spring break that there is an enormous amount of, nah, that's not good, let's do it again. Cut! <laughs> no. All right, so when I did our initial addiction lectures, it was before spring break, and I hadn't had enough time to truly update my lectures. Now, the amount of addiction research is basically doubling about every six months to every year. And so the lectures that I had given, although they were up to date, yeah, a year or two ago, they're not as up to date now as they were. And so over spring break, I spent a lot of time looking at more recent addiction models. I've been mentioning them in class, but never had them fully integrated into the lecture. So what we're gonna do right now is we're gonna fully integrate the newer addiction model into the lecture. So everything that we talked about at the beginning is still the same in terms of what addiction is and isn't. Um, so it's not tolerance, it's not physiological dependence, it's not withdrawal syndrome, and it's not even psychological dependence, whatever that means. You know, all of that stuff is still about the same. Now, one of the original addiction um, uh, definitions is that addiction is doing drugs 
even though they cause negative effects in your life. So when you take that sort of definition, you've already defined right into the definition drugs. But we all know that people can have addictive behaviors that are destructive to their life that have nothing to do with drugs. And so our traditional model of addiction as a disease caused by drugs that impact dopamine, well, that doesn't really fit in terms of gambling, um, pornography addictions, sex addictions, um, food addictions. None of that really fits into that drug model. And so the broader, the broader definition that we're going to talk about today, or no, the broader model that we're going to talk about today, is able to explain those things in addition to drugs. So let's just talk really quickly about the traditional model that we thought about. So we all know that our brains adapt to drugs. I mean, that seems pretty self-explanatory. And even within just regular psychotropic drugs, like an antidepressant, well, you take an antidepressant at a low dose, and then after about two weeks, you have to raise the dose. And then after about two weeks after that, you may need to raise the dose again. Over time, your brain will adapt, and you'll probably need an even higher dose. If you come off of that antidepressant, suddenly, you're going to go into some serious withdrawal syndrome. No one ever says, oh, I'm addicted to my antidepressant. And yet, it displays all of those hallmarks that are sometimes associated with addiction, and it's not really addiction. So tolerance and withdrawal syndrome are not addiction. But they're evidence that your brain is adapting to the drug. Does that make sense? So the idea, the model, was that when we do something really enjoyable, we get a little hit of dopamine. And we talked about dopamine is the um, kind of the reward for accomplishing goals. How many of you like to make lists to do things? And the very first thing you do is you put four things on there that you've already accomplished. So you can cross them off right away. I feel good about myself already. And then how many of you say, all right, this is the hardest thing on the list and it's going to take me the most amount of time. Let me do that first. Or you say, ooh, let me do these short little ones first so I can feel like I'm doing something. And so as we work towards a goal, we get little hits of dopamine that make us feel good and reinforce going the goal. Right. Um, and that is one of the reasons why social media can be addictive, because you get this little hit of dopamine every time you post something. Oh, look, I got a like. Oh, look, someone. Yeah, and you, I, I got an interaction. And so that's a little goal that you can work towards. Um, one of the things that sometimes happens is when you have reached a big goal and you have no more goal left, now you have nothing to work towards, so patients or people sometimes feel depressed. This is very common in athletes who get to the, the height of whatever it is. So maybe it's Olympic gold medal. What do you do the day after you win an Olympic gold medal? You got your life. Your life's purpose is met now. What do you have left? A lot of times they're depressed the day after they win the gold medal. Um, so that's one of the great things about um, Tom Brady. Now that he's won six uh, Super Bowls, you know anyone else who comes behind him when you won one super, win one Super Bowl, well, pff, you got five more to go before you're as good as Brady. So eh, everyone in the world now who is a football player doesn't have to feel that sense of purposelessness until they get to their seventh win of the Super Bowl. Now it's a great, great service that he performed for the world, I think. But anyway. Um, so dopamine is what we get when we accomplish goals, and it makes us feel good. Now, how many of you have ever, you know, one day you're doing great things, you got all these things are coming together, you're like, this is great, and then something happens that you receive some news, and that goal just kind of like, progress towards the goal goes away, and how do you feel? Like, forget it. I'm not going to do anything. I'm not even going to try tomorrow. I'm just, I'm just done. <sighs> you just feel horrible. And that's what happens when we don't get the dopamine. You just feel like you don't even want to get out of bed. There's no purpose. So that dopamine helps to give us purpose, give us direction, and then it's the reward for accomplishing those goals. Does that make sense? So um, what happens when you take drugs that can give you much higher levels of dopamine the idea is that you have this really spike up. So let's say that this would be your ordinary max dopamine level you can do. But the, think of the most fun thing you can do in the entire world, the most exciting thing you can do, skydiving, sex, whatever. And the, the max you can get is this. 
Now, when you do drugs, you go higher than that. Your brain's like, whoa, I gotta do that some more. But the more you do it, your brain goes, you know what, uh, maybe it's dangerous to have dopamine up here. Let's build a structure that will make it so that it's harder for the dopamine to get through. So you build a little barrier. So now when you do drugs, you don't get dopamine up here. I mean, dope, that much dopamine can be stimulated, but in your brain, your only brain is only getting this much dopamine because of this barrier. Does that make sense? So now you come off the drug and your dopamine levels down here but you've got this barrier, your brain can't even detect the dopamine. So now, when you come off a drug, it's not that you don't feel good, it's that you feel bad. So that depressive state you felt like when you were defeated, when you didn't get the goal that you were like blocked from your goal, that's how a person feels all the time. They, they need the drug not to feel good, they need the drug to not feel bad. And that is kind of the, the the dopamine model of addiction. Now, guess what? Those changes to your brain are not permanent. The, your brain changed, we call that plasticity of the brain. Your brain changed in, re, in response to the excess dopamine from the drug. And guess what happens in six months to a year after you stop the drug? your brain plastic plasticity goes right back and you can actually have a normal brain again so it's not that once addicted because of the structure of the brain always addicted there's something else going on that has to be there for addiction to occur and so that's what we're going to talk about now is that newer model of addiction so the newer model is um, three, com three main components. So the first one is a deep learning pattern. And this is pretty consistent with what we've already said, that addiction is a learned pattern of behavior. So going back to the idea we talked about in the original lecture, that when, if you have a baby who's born to someone who's been doing crack cocaine, that little baby has a physiological response to cocaine but it's not addicted to cocaine. It doesn't even know what cocaine is. It has no idea that if I do this behavior, I'll feel this way. It's just in withdrawal syndrome. Same as if a person were, uh, was on, um, was on uh, too many um, opioids, well, addictive, so never mind, wrong, bad example. If a person was on too many uh, uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, antidepressant, and they come off of that suddenly, they're going to experience withdrawal syndrome just like a person who's coming off of the cocaine does. So that baby has no established pattern of behavior, therefore they can't truly be addicted. So where does addiction come from? It comes from a learning process. So it's now this is where dopamine is part of this. So we have this brain that goes, huh, that's an interesting idea. Maybe I want that. And so then there's conversations between different parts of your brain that go, hey, yeah, you, that, that's worth going after. Oh, yeah? Maybe it is worth going after. Boop, little bot of dopamine. Oh, yeah, pursue that now. And so now you get this drive toward getting that, that thing. So how many of you have ever had this experience? Um, you can just put it right there for now, thanks. So how many of you have ever had this experience where you hadn't even thought of something? And then you see it. You're like, oh, I'd like that. And then all of a sudden, that's all you can think about. I have to get it, I have to get it, I wanna get it, how do I get it? And you start researching it, and you're looking for it, you're like, and, and you have the sudden desire for this thing that you didn't even know about before. Well, that's that little process in your brain going back and forth with, I want this, oh yeah, we'll go get that. Well here, have some dopamine in response to pursuing that item. And so we have a learning behavior going on in that regards. Now, when it comes to something that we, typically we know that, the things that we're addicted to are not good, right? So I'm gonna use donuts as the example. So let's say for a moment, you're like, you know what, I love donuts, but I know that they're not really good for, you know. <laughs> okay, so I have no intention of eating donuts today. And you, you didn't even think about donuts. It wasn't even on your radar. You're, you, you got my, 
my calories in my fitness pal. I've got a healthy breakfast already. I've got my lunch figured out. I already know what dessert I'm having for dinner and I'm gonna be under my daily calories. Mm. I am the weight loss queen or king, as the case may be. So, but you go into work and someone's got donuts and they're not just any donuts, they're Jupiter donuts. And you're like, oh, Jupiter donuts. But, but now you're going, there's donuts in that room. And, and your mind is like, yeah, you could have donuts. Uh, you, you, you could have the donuts, you know. I gotta get the donuts. So every day, you know, the rest of that day, you're going in, you're walking by the office who has the donuts in it, you're like, and you spent the whole day going, donuts. Now, you finally get to the point where you're like, I'm bringing in some of the next thing, but hey, whatever. So, someone then comes to the end of the day and they give you the donut. You're like, you smelled it. Once you smelled it, it was over, you had to eat it, right? So then you eat the donut. Now, how did that donut taste? Delicious. Oh, it was good. How'd that make you feel? It made you feel good, right? Oh, so delicious. You know what? Give me another one. No. So the donut itself is good, and, and you knew it was good, and that's why you had to avoid it, because you, you knew you shouldn't be eating that, not because you already had your calories. It, but you ate it. So you enjoyed the donut, but now how do you feel? Now you feel guilty. And when you feel guilty, you feel bad. And when you feel bad, what do you want to do? Something that makes you feel good. And you know what makes you feel good just a minute ago? Eating a donut. Eating a donut. So you know what? Now let's take, now you eat a second donut. And now you feel even guiltier. So now what do you do? <laughs> Maybe you go for a third. Okay. And, and you get the idea, right? How many of you have ever had that happen? Now, losing weight on a diet isn't really that hard. You know what's really hard? keeping the weight off. And research has shown time and time again that this is what happens. A person will have something they shouldn't. And not necessarily that they shouldn't in, in, in the broad sense of it, but in the sense that it was above their calories for the day or wasn't on their diet, whatever. They, they broke the rule. And once they do that, they feel guilty. So instead of just saying, okay, well that was fun, I enjoyed that, yes, that was great, but now I'm gonna go back to my diet, they double down, or triple down, or quadruple down. And so instead of having 600 extra calories for the day, they end up having 3,000 extra calories for the day. And that, and once they do that that day, then it's so much harder to get back on the diet the next day, and they just spiral down until they regain all their weight. Whereas if they had just said, man, that donut, that was probably 600 calories, but man, it was good. All right, back on the diet now. They wouldn't gain the extra weight because they would be able to maintain their their stuff. So this, this particular idea here, this deep learning pattern that involves guilt and then making yourself good by doing the thing that made you feel bad in the first place is, you know, very much it helps to explain a lot of addictive behaviors that are not necessarily drug behaviors. So that's the first component is the deep learning pattern. The second aspect of the model is what we might call a decreased sense of future and an urgent now. Now, for those of you who had me in uh, FYE, we talked about the marshmallow experiment. Do you guys remember what that is? So in the marshmallow experiment, what you do is you take a child and you put them in a room by themselves and you give them a marshmallow. And you say, hey kid, if you don't eat that marshmallow for five minutes, I'll give you a second marshmallow. And then you leave and you record what the kid does. And, and the kid's like, studying it, smelling it, kiss it, lick it. Take a little bite out of it. Eat that marshmallow. Um, what they've shown is that kids who can successfully resist eating the marshmallow for five minutes so that they can get a second marshmallow have the kind of self-control that it takes to be successful in life even 20 years later. Even at age four, the ability to delay gratification for five minutes is predictive of success later in life. Because what is success in life about? 
saying no to all the stupid ideas that are really fun right now so that you can be a little more successful in the future. And that was our whole thing about the diet with the, with the donuts. It's not that you can't have a donut. It's not that a donut doesn't taste good. It's not that a donut is bad per se, but it didn't fit into your plan for that day which was to do a longer term goal of be more fit or lose weight or keep the weight off. And so because of that, when you give in to the donut, what you're saying is my need to feel good now is more important than my future life. And within the context of a single donut, it's kind of silly. But when you think about it in terms of drugs or gambling or pornography, it makes a lot of sense that your, your need to have this little bit of pleasure right now is more important than your life with your wife in the future, is more important than your kids, is more important than your entire family's well-being. You know, especially like with gambling, you know, you can, you have people who spend their entire life fortune, you know, sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars, their wives and their kids don't even know until um, creditors start calling asking to collect on debts. And you're like, well, what do you mean the, the electricity bill hasn't been paid? We have like tons of money in the bank, what happened? Yeah, so that's the idea of that increased sense of urgency versus a decreased sense of future. So it's an inability to look beyond right now to see the future and then make choices for your future. Um, if you listen to someone like Jordan, uh, Jordan Peterson, he talks about that there's not just a single you, there's multiple yous. And you are actually made up of multiple subparts. So there's a part of you that just wants, just wants something now. There's a part of you that wants to plan for the future. And the part of you that those two things are competing with each other right now. And so when you choose the things that will give you a better life in the future, what you're actually doing is you're not acting on your own behalf now. You're acting off on the behalf of the you that you'll become in the future. Does that make sense? Kind of cool idea. Um, but that's the idea with that second component. And then the third component is called executive fatigue. Now, what's an executive? It's the adjective of what verb? Execute. execute. So the idea implicit in this is that there's multiple things you could do, but what you actually do is what's being executed. Um, in the military, you, you typically have, like say on a ship, you would have the captain of the ship. And they're in charge of making decisions, but they actually do the work or they just have other people to do it. They have other people to do it. So they're giving orders and then other people are carrying out those orders. And there's usually a person who's just underneath the captain called the executive officer. So when the captain says, all right, we need to go to this place at this speed, the executive officer is gonna go around and make sure that that happens. So the executive officer is in charge of executing the orders. Does that make sense? So the idea of executive fatigue is the idea of being in charge of these competing personalities that you have inside of you, that this one wants to be lazy, this one wants to eat, this one wants to sleep, and this one wants to be successful in life. And which of those personalities is gonna win in this given moment? So the, the part of your brain that's responsible for choosing which one of those personalities gets to win and execute their orders, that's what we mean by executive control or executive function. So an executive fatigue is the idea that you can only make so many choices. And eventually you get tired and you let the things, you, you, you just let your self-control go and do things you know are not necessarily in your best interest because you just got tired of making decisions. So. You actually see this sort of thing reflected in very, some very successful people like Steve Jobs. They decided, I'm going to eat the same thing every day and I'm going to wear the same clothes every day because those are two less choices that I have to make in life. And that will allow me to have more brain power to make decisions in my business. And so going back to that donut idea, what point did you have to say, no, how often did you have to say no to those donuts? 
You had to say no the moment you walked in the door. You had to say no every time you walked by the office. You had to say no when you saw your coworker eating one of them. You had to say no when someone brought them to you. You had to say no when you smelled it. At some point in the day, you just got tired of saying no. You know, they've done studies where they, they uh, take people, uh, some of these studies aren't necessarily you know, the most rigorous, but they take people and they say, okay, um, you can have, here's a bowl of cookies, and here's a bowl of radishes. You can eat as many cookies as you want, but you can't have any radishes. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, these, are, these are hungry people. They haven't eaten in eight, eight hours. You can have as many cookies as you want, no radishes. And so they lead it, let them eat whatever they want, and then they give them some tests. And then they do the opposite, where they say, here's a bowl of cookies, here's a bowl of radishes. You can eat as many radishes as you want, but you can't have cookies. And they give them the same series of little tests. And the people who are allowed to eat the cookies do better than the people who don't. And the idea behind that was that it takes mental energy to say no. Don't eat the cookies. And that will reduce your ability to think and, and perform later on. Uh, how many of you ever been in a meeting where they had food present and you're like, well, I don't want to eat the food because I've already eaten and I'm, it's not my... And the food is sitting right in front of you. And the entire meeting, what are you doing? What happens about three quarters of the way through the meeting? Nah, yeah, forget it, I'm going to have the... Right? And, and that, that is executive fatigue. Now, knowing that, one of the very, very important things we should do for patients who have addiction is to help them with executive fatigue. They need to change their environment. You know, if you know that one of the, re one of the things that gets you in the mood to do whatever it is you do, say drink, alcohol, being around other people who drink alcohol, if that's one of your things, well, maybe you should be around people who don't drink alcohol. Um, Everyone has slightly different triggers. Everyone is slightly different. No one is exactly alike. And tr teaching people how to avoid their own things are very important. Now, part of the reason this is all so important is that if you look at these things, which one of these three things involves a disease process? Oh, none of them, right. Because addiction isn't a disease. But Dr. Heyman, that's the first thing you learn in AA. Well, AA is an abject failure. 95% of the people who go through AA, guess what? They don't, they don't, they're not helped. Now, the 5% that do get helped, you know what they say? AA saved my life, this is the best thing ever. But what you're hearing from is a very small minority. Uh, research has actually shown that believing that addiction is a disease is a risk factor for failing. The idea that, well, you're not in charge of your choices, you don't have a choice, this is a disease that has you, means that you don't have responsibility. So when you do fail, when you do relapse, well, it's just the disease, it's not me. Does that make sense? So. It's extremely important that we understand that although we've been taught most of our lives that addiction is a disease, is not true. Now, it doesn't mean that a person is in complete control. They do need help. But what they don't need is treatment. What they need to do is to have a reason to make better choices. So there's newer models of recovery now, in the United States, the vast majority of treatment centers and recovery centers are 12-step based, which is based off the AA model, which says that addiction is a disease. So almost all of the money to be made in rehab is in treating it as a disease. But when you don't treat it as a disease, when you use these newer models, you actually have much better success in treating addiction. Um, the other thing is that there are just in the case of opioid addiction itself, there are what are called partial agonist antagonist. So this is a drug that it does stimulate opioid receptors, but it also blocks them at the same time so that they, another drug can't also activate them. So it's kind of like a Narcan that has a very small amount of opioid effect as well. 
Uh, one of them is called buprenorphine. And patients in buprenorphine clinics can be extremely successful in their treatment. Um, remember we talked about earlier that when it comes to opioids, if when you take your Percocet, you don't like the way it makes you feel, it's gonna be very difficult for you to become addicted. On the other hand, there are some people in life that when they take the opioid for the first time, they take Percocet, they're like, I feel amazing. This is the best thing I've ever done. That person is very likely to become addicted, but again, it all comes back to these three things. So we're treating addiction as though it's something that's inevitable, it's a disease, and we're allowing people to not take responsibility for themselves by using that model. Now, all of that is to say that if you're, um, I'll put up some resources to um, books and articles that support what I've been telling you right now, so you don't want to just take my word for it, but there are very successful physicians and uh, counselors who treat addiction not treating it as a disease, but treating it as choices a person makes who has the ability to change. And doing that, I think, is a much more humane way of practicing because it preserves our human dignity and it also preserves one of the most important things that makes us human, which is our ability to choose. Um, and we should also say it's a God-given gift that God gave us the ability to choose. If you can't choose, are you truly human? So all of that to say, addiction is a disease. All right. Um, okay, we'll do NSAIDs next. All right, at this time we're going to go back and we're going to talk about NSAIDs again just ever so briefly because um, some of you expressed that you were surprised how many NSAIDs there were on the test. So remember that the test is going to be about 60-ish questions, and half of them will be on pain management, and then about half of those will be on drugs. So the big categories of drugs under pain management is anesthe anesthetics, there'll probably only be like two or three questions on that. Opioids, you can probably expect about half-ish the questions on that. And then NSAIDs and acetaminophen. So say acetaminophen has three to four questions, well that leaves about 10, no, nah, leaves about eight questions for NSAIDs. And you're going, but there's only two slides on it, so there's only gonna be like two questions. So that can be a little bit confusing. Um, so that can be a little bit confusing to students. So let's just recap NSAIDs real quick like. So we have arachidonic acid. Arachidonic acid is converted into prostaglandins by enzymes. Two of the enzymes, the two we need to know for right now, is COX-1 and COX-2. So COX-1, COX-2. Now, which of those two leads to inflammation under ordinary circumstances? Does COX-1 lead to inflammatory prostaglandins, or does COX-2 lead to inflammatory prostaglandins? COX-2. So when we give NSAIDs for the purposes of reducing inflammation, reducing fever, and reducing pain, which of these two pathways are we wanting to target? We're wanting to inhibit COX-2. So COX-2 is almost all, when we inhibit COX-2, that's almost all therapeutic effect. Does that make sense? Now, when we inhibit COX-1, what are we inhibiting? We're inhibiting gastric mucus. Is that an adverse effect or a therapeutic effect? That's an adverse effect. When we inhibit renal perfusion, is that adverse or therapeutic? Adverse. When we inhibit, um, uh, what do you call it? Clotting, is that adverse or therapeutic? Well, that could actually be either, right? Now, there's only one drug that is used therapeutically to reduce clotting, what is that? Aspirin. Aspirin. So for everything else, it's gonna be adverse. Does that make sense? And then the um, 
Well, macrophage function, that kind of goes along with, with the therapeutic over here, but you can pretty much ignore it. The last one would be the uh, uterine contractions. And this one could be, it could be therapeutic, right? If you're treating uh, menstrual cramps. But in the hospital system, in the healthcare system, the vast majority of people who are taking NSAIDs are not taking them for menstrual cramps. And even a person who does take them for menstrual cramps, how often are they taking them? Two to three days, once a month, right? It's not like they're gonna be taking these all the time. The vast majority of reasons why people take NSAIDs is for this over here. So when you inhibit COX-1, what are you primarily getting? adverse effects. When you inhibit COX-2, what are you primarily getting? Therapeutic effects. Now, there's only one truly selective um, COX-2 inhibitor on the market, and that one is Celebrex. So Celebrex does only COX-2, Celecoxib. All of the others inhibit both, so we draw them in the middle. Ibuprofen, naproxen, ketorolac, and aspirin. Now, there's a whole bunch of others with varying degrees of selectivity, but we're not going to talk about those in this course. So when you become a nurse practitioner, then we'll talk about that. But for now, just these four plus Celebrex are what you need to know. So on the test, you might need to know, you know what's producing adverse effect, what's producing therapeutic effect, and which of these are selective or not selective. Any questions about that little NSAID supplement? All right. Now, there's something else that we need to supplement that you guys didn't mention, but I'm going to mention, and that is IV acetaminophen. So there has been a growing trend towards using IV acetaminophen, and I've got a little article about it on the test guide that you can read, but what's really important is the way that you answer the question. So when you answer the question, you need, you, you, why are we doing this? Well, you have to compare it to something else. So if you compare IV acetaminophen to PO acetaminophen, that's one thing. If you're comparing IV acetaminophen to opioids, that's another thing. And you need to make it clear in your answer. So sometimes students will answer, well, it's safer. Safer than what? And what's the other question that has to be answered in safer? Why? So safer than what? and how is it safer or why is it safer. So let's just go over a couple of the advantages of IV acetaminophen. So the very first one is that when compared to PO acetaminophen, when compared to PO, it doesn't go through the liver first. So there's no first pass effect. Now why is that important? Okay, so why does a person become toxic in the first place? It's the accumulation, of, the accumulation of metabolite in the liver. So if the very, very first place that all of the acetaminophen goes when it gets absorbed is to your liver, you're giving a whole bunch to your liver first and then it goes into the systemic circulation. When you give it PIV, it doesn't have that first pass effect, so it's going to your entire body first, and then a little bit by little bit is going towards your liver. So you don't get this giant rush into your liver at first. That makes it a little bit safer for your liver than PO. Now, you still have to obey or follow the 4,000 milligram rule. You can't get away from that, but it is a little bit safer for your liver. Now, when compared to um, opioids, there are several reasons why we can do that. So the very first one is that you can use it during surgery. Now, 
sometimes students will say, well, you can use it during surgery. Well, yeah, you can also use opioids during surgery too, but what's the issue? When you give a, pa when you give a uh, patient an opioid during surgery, what does it do to their waking up later? Makes it take longer. Okay, so you can give it during surgery without prolonging the post-anesthesia process. Does that make sense? Second one, well, less addictive. Third one is it is safer in children. Now, opioids in children can be given safely. However, there is an increased risk of respiratory depression when compared to adults. They're more likely to experience respiratory depression, which is more likely to be dangerous to them. When you give acetaminophen instead, you avoid that issue. So those are some of the big reasons why we're moving towards IV acetaminophen. Um, a couple years back, probably about well, a couple years, like about 15 to 20 years ago, there was a really big push to assess and treat pain. And it became one of the big, big, big standards of care. You, how, how well are you assessing and treating pain? Well, when you assess pain and you're treating it more aggressively, what are you going to do? Give more opioids. And now we're like, ah, oh, opioid epidemic. What are we going to do? Let's not give opioids. And well, here you've got something that can be given instead. So on your test, you're going to have to know why we're moving towards IV acetaminophen. Um, note that IV ketorolac can also be used in place of acetaminophen or in combination with acetaminophen. So it's not like IV acetaminophen is the only non-opioid tool in our uh, that utility belt. Sorry, in our arsenal. All right, is there anything else you guys want me to cover before we move on um, to pain? No, not to pain, to respiratory drugs. I'm gonna skip the humoral cell since you said it was already in there. All right. So let me grab the show and tell. So the very first thing we're going to talk about, and let's not do that way. <laughs> Take 107. Yeah. All right, we're going to talk about respiratory pharmacology. So the first thing we need to talk about with respiratory pharmacology is the difference between inhaled and systemic drugs. So systemic drugs are given to the entire body, and then they get to the lung through the blood circulation. Now, one of the great things about your lung is that it has an enormous amount of so blood circulating through it. All of the blood in your body circulates through it basically every other beat. You know, so whatever drop of blood goes to the body on the left side of the heart has to come back to the lungs on the right side. So you have an enormous amount of blood flow through it, so it's really easy to get drug to the lungs, giving it systemically. Now what's the downside of systemic drugs being given for respiratory problems? It affects the rest of your body, so you're more likely to experience adverse effects. So the trade-off is when you do an inhaled medication, it's going to be targeted toward the lung and airway, but it might not be able to get there as well. If you have a disease that limits the ability to breathe in or out, that's going to limit your ability, the effectiveness of an inhaled drug. So generally speaking, the more severe a patient is, 
the more we're going to move towards systemic drugs. The less severe they are, the better we're going to be able to use the inhaled drugs. Now, the big advantage of inhaled drugs is fewer adverse effects. So let's talk about the various types of inhaled drugs. The very first one is our handy dandy inhaler, also known as an MDI metered dose inhaler. So for those of you who didn't understand how to spell that, M metered dose D I inhaler. So when a person says my inhaler, you typically think of something like this. And what's the fancy schmancy name for it? metered dose inhaler. So in this case, um, you've got a little canister of medication. And it goes inside this kind of little plastic thing. And it has a little mouthpiece protector that usually patients lose this after like the second day. But hey, whatever. Um, some of them are very fancy. And they have it like a little counter in the back. It'll tell you how many puffs are left. Um, but this one doesn't have that. So the way that you are supposed to take this correctly, breathe in. Breathe out. Place it in your mouth. And then the idea is to and at the same time. Now, most of us learned how to, well, most of you haven't seen the movie Goonies. But had you seen Goonies, that's where you probably would have learned how to take an inhaler. And it would have looked like this. That is not how you do it. So once the ends, you keep breathing in. Right? So it's like this. Ready? Now hold it, and now exhale slowly. Why do you want to hold it? Why do you hold it? OK, so you breathe the medication in. And so here's the little particles. And then you breathe out. What happens to the little particles? They go right back out. By holding your breath, you're giving them a chance to settle against the sides of the bronchi, which will allow them more time to work and be absorbed. So it's important that we make sure that patients hold that breath before breathing out. So again, breathe out and at the same time. You don't stop breathing in after the ch stops. Count for five seconds, and then breathe out. Now, um, we have two major kinds of drugs that we use for respiratory. We have bronchodilators, which make the bronchi larger, which allows more airflow to go through. And then we have anti-inflammatories. If a person has both a bronchodilator and an anti-inflammatory inhaler, which of them should be taken first? The bronchodilator should be taken first because it will make the bronchi larger, which will allow the um, anti-inflammatory to penetrate farther into the airway and be more effective. Now, if a person is supposed to be, take two puffs of their bronchodilator, they need to wait at least one minute between the inhalations. So sometimes you'll see patients do like this. You might as well have just done one. You take one dose, wait about a minute to five minutes, then take the second dose. What that does allows the first dose to begin to work and expand the patient's airway so that the second dose will be even more effective. Does that make sense? OK. So this is a meter dose inhaler. It's what we typically think of when we say inhaler. So an inhaler is a bronchodilator? No, it could be either. It could be either. Yes. Or. Now, what if you have someone who doesn't have enough coordination to ch and ch at the same time? Well, now we've got a spacer. So the spacer has a, mouth, a mouthpiece shaped on one end. And that end goes in like this. And then you can pop the other side off. Now, the way that this is supposed to work is you no longer ch and ch at the same time. Now you, it's inside here, and now does that make sense? So you ch then got it? So with the spacer, you ch then 
with just the meter dose inhaler, you and at the same time. So the purpose of a spacer is to allow someone who cannot coordinate at the same time to still use their inhaler correctly. Everything else goes the same. Deep breath, you know, breathe out, breathe in all the way, hold it for five seconds, and then breathe out again. Any questions about using a spacer? Okay, you'll, learn, you'll learn this again in more detail and actually practice it when you do tech skills. The next thing we have is something called a dry powdered inhaler. Um, so in a dry powdered inhaler, what you have is you have a little capsule, which I have the remains of a capsule here. So you have a little capsule that goes into the device, and then you press a button, and these little things go through and pierce the capsule. So the capsule's got powder in it, dry powder. And then once it's pierced, you just you breathe out, breathe in, hold your five seconds, and then breathe out again. So with the dry powder inhaler, it's very similar, except sometimes patients who aren't used to these will try and push the button and at the same time, and that's not how it works. Push the button, pierces it, and you're done. So most of these dry powdered inhalers are long-acting um, long acting bronchodilators. We'll talk about, about brands, names, and drugs it, later. So um, this particular one is from Spiriva. It's called a handy inhaler. Um, there's another kind that's like a little bit thinner and longer looking instead of more egg shaped. So they come in different shapes and varieties depending on the drug that is associated with it. Dry powdered inhaler. Now, this is another form of dry powdered inhaler called a discus. Um, this is marketed by GlaxoSmithKline. I'm pretty sure they've got a medical device uh, patent on the device itself. So in this case, you hold it like a little hamburger, and there's a little, little spot here. You put your thumb or your finger, and you open it like this to expose the mouthpiece. It also exposes this little lever. So what you do is you push the lever back. What? Push the lever back, breathe out. I think I'm holding upside down. Yeah. Shows me I'm left handed. There you go. Hold it left handed, then pop it open, push the lever back, and then breathe. Again, sometimes I have patients who are used to regular inhalers and they're going, and that's not how it works. So, there's a little, there's a little um, disc inside of this thing, and every time you cock the little, the little lever back, it puts a new, a new little dose in there. So you cock it, then breathe. Same as, the, um, as this kind of dry powdered inhaler, you want to breathe out, put it to your mouth, one big breath in, hold it for five seconds, breathe out again. I kind of sound like I'm a broken record, don't I? That's because it's the same. It's important that people do it correctly. Um, so the discus um, is usually Advair is the brand that's most commonly associated with discus, and that's actually a combination of a long-acting bronchodilator and a steroid anti-inflammatory, and we'll talk about specifics later. Then our next and last inhalation device is what's called, is what's called, Oh, she didn't give me the whole thing. Um, it's called a nebulizer. So the word nebulous means cloudy. And so what we're doing is we're taking a liquid drug and we're turning it into a cloud. So there has to be some sort of air source in the hospital. It's going to be on the wall, and you connect the tubing to the wall. It could be a device like this. This is a very old-fashioned style device and loud. They have ones that are like the size of like a pack of gum that are really small and quiet and battery operated, but you know, whatever. You got the old one. So you connect it to your air source, and then you connect it to a device like this, and the drug, you just twist this open, and the drug goes in there. So you can also give just, these are just saline. Um, so you can put saline in there as well if you just want to moisten the patient's lungs or airway. Say they've got a lot of uh, mucus that needs to be coughed up, but it's dry and thick. You can use this to thin it out. But you also have drug that sometimes appears in these little, um, they call them fish or bullets, depending on where you are. I guess it looks like a fish. 
Uh, anyway, so drug can come in this or just in this case, just normal saline. That would go into this little chamber here. You put this back on, and then there's a mouthpiece of some sort. Um, the mouthpiece in this case is a mask. Um, you can use this for like a little kid or for an adult who maybe is too weak to hold it up themselves. Um, but more commonly, you're going to see a little mouthpiece on here, and the patient holds it to their mouth and breathes it in. Now, these don't work if you don't put it up to your mouth and breathe it in. Sometimes you see patients in the hospital like this. So blah, 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 talking to someone else. And then the, the, you know, the nurse, the respiratory therapist comes back in. Well, did your breathing treatment work? No, it didn't work at all. You, none of it went in your lungs. It all went into the air. Um, usually the mouthpiece on these is about that big. And there's a tiny little bit on this end. And some patients can't breathe enough to keep it from going out the back. So in that case, they have a spacer that is like a long plastic device about that long that gets stuck on the back of there. And that way, as it builds up inside that little tube, <gasps> breathe it all in, let it build up again, breathe it in again. So for those of you who remember in health assessment, you took a breath, you're like, ooh, dizzy, too many deep breaths. That's how sometimes patients can feel when they're trying to do this. So that having that little spacer on there allows them not to have to take as many breaths, but still get the medication in their lungs. Any questions about nebulizer? All right, so we've covered the major types of respiratory um, drugs. So now we're gonna talk, or at least in terms of delivery mechanism for inhaled devices, now we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about the actual drug classes. So the two broad categories, what were they? Okay, bronchodilators and anti-inflammatories. Now, one of the things that I sometimes have a bad habit of doing is talking about lung. And we're going to we're going to expand the lung. This drug works in the lung. For the most part, where do the drugs work? In the bronchi, technically the airway. So if you hear me say that, you know, albuterol works in the lung, I'm really meaning airway. Does that make sense? Okay. So bronchodilators are the first. Would someone mind uh, turning that light back on? Okay. Now we've actually already learned about most of the bronchodilators, at least how they work. So if you remember back from the very first test, neuro, we had beta agonists. And there's how many types of beta are there? Well, technically there's more, but we only learned two. So beta one and beta two. And we said one heart, two lungs. And we really mean airway. So beta two primarily is in the airway. When you stimulate beta two, what do you get? I don't know. Well, dilation. you get bronchodilation, but you also get two other things. What are the two other things? Increasing. Decreased mucus secretion. Maybe it's just, yeah, there's something else. But anyway, so those are the big two things. You, so you get bronchodilation and you get decreased mucus, which are helpful for patients who have those issues. So. Beta agonists, the first thing is we have non-selective ones. Non-selective. Now, what's the ultimate non-selective beta agonist? Epinephrine. Epinephrine. Oh, epinephrine. Epinephrine, yeah. Epinephrine is, it affects every adrenergic receptor. So it's the ultimate non-selective. The only time we're going to use epinephrine is in a patient who has what we call status asthmaticus. So status asthmaticus is an asthma attack that does not respond to medical treatment. That has lasted for at least, some sources say 15 minutes, some sources say 20 minutes, so somewhere between 15 to 20 minutes. If the patient has received medical treatment, not they took their inhaler at home, but they went to say the emergency room and it did not respond to the treatment they gave in the emergency room, we consider it status asthmaticus. There's an increased risk of sudden death 
for patients in status asthmaticus. The treatment of choice is epinephrine. epinephrine. Ephedrine is also another one. Um, ephedrine is no longer, um, well, it used to be over the counter in terms of, it was also available in a um, herbal form called ma huang, but that is no longer legal. Um, ephedrine can be used to make um, crystal meth, just like pseudoephedrine. They both came from the ma huang plant. Um, so nowadays, if you want to get ephedrine, you have to go to the pharmacy, show them your ID, you record your driver's license, and you can only get a certain amount per month. But it is available um, under the brand names Primatine, Mist, and Broncade. Um, some people will use Broncade tablets as a weight loss device. So aspirin, ephedrine, and caffeine together help to promote weight loss by uh, reducing appetite and stimulating metabolism. True story. All right, back to our story. Um, so those are the non-selective ones we're gonna talk about. The, others, the other two are, well, the others are selective. So beta-2 agonist, I guess I should write the word agonist at the top here. Beta-2 agonists, we have non-selective and selective. What are your two non-selectives? And ephedrine. Now, I can tell you for your test, ephedrine isn't on there. <laughs> what will be on there? Epinephrine. epinephrine. When do you use it? Only for status asthmaticus. Status What is that? When, when they, they're not responding to the treatment in the ER. They haven't responded to treatment, and it's been at least 15 to 20 minutes. 15 to 20 minutes. And why is that important? Increased risk of sudden death. All right, so for the selective beta-2 agonists, we're going to break them into immediate and long-acting. So the short-acting or immediate-acting can be used as rescue inhalers. What does that mean? I have symptoms right now. I have shortness of breath. I need to, be, I need to get relief right now. What, what would you take? Short-acting beta-2 agonist. So the number one is albuterol, which I can't spell. Oh, I, I didn't actually mean I couldn't spell it. I just uh. can't talk and spell at the same time. <laughs> but thank you. Um, so albuterol. Albuterol is the one that everyone knows if they either had asthma or has a friend who has asthma, chances are they're on albuterol. It is the most common rescue inhaler. It's also available in nebulizers. It's not available in these other things. So it's either an inhaler or a nebulizer. Is nebulizer like a home treatment as well, or is it only done at home? Yeah, you can use nebulizers both in the hospital and at home. They're typically used in either children who don't have enough coordination for this, or in elderly folks who need a higher level of, of um, delivery. Now, studies show, research studies show that this can be as effective as this as a delivery device if you use this correctly. And how many people use it correctly? So in practice, this is going to be a better delivery, delivery device for most people. But if you can teach them how to use it right, which I taught you guys right, and you can teach your patients right, this can be just as effective. Does that make sense? OK. But I mean, just this is giving you one little and this you're breathing in for five minutes. So you've got a lot more chance to breathe this in. Okay. Um, so albuterol is the, you know, like the original one, and it's the one everyone thinks of. Now, there's another version called leave albuterol. So albuterol is a um, racemic mixture. What does that mean? Oh, he's a mime. Yeah. So a racemic mixture means you got left and right hand of the drug. So what is leave albuterol? It's the left hand only. Well, that's my left hand. Uh, your left hand. <laughs> so, so only one hand. And supposedly, it's a little bit more effective and has a little bit less adverse effect 
than albuterol by itself, the racemic mixture. So you, um, leave albuterol is more than uh, 15 years old now. It's probably close to about 20 years old now in terms of being broadly marketed. So it's probably coming off patent if it hasn't already and will probably be more and more available as it becomes cheaper and there's more generics available. Um, with these two drugs, the number one adverse effect are going to be sympathetic response. So people would feel um, anxious, so might have um, uh, tachycardia or palpitations. Now, some patients have told me that they only get those kinds of adverse effects when they take generic versions of their inhaler, but when they do the brand name, like uh, Ventolin or Proventil, that they actually don't have those symptoms. Now, that's just anecdotal, but for whatever it's worth, some people have told me that. So if you have a patient who has adverse effects and they're taking the generic, you might want to have them try paying a little bit more, getting the brand name, and see how that works for them. All right, so albuterol and leave albuterol, what is their major claim to fame? What kind of inhaler will they be? Yes, but what, what, are, we, what are we gonna use it for? rescue inhaler. So also short acting is what's used for PRN. If you have symptoms that you want to resolve now, you use a rescue inhaler. If you think you might die from not being able to breathe, what do you use? Rescue inhaler. All right, then we have long acting. Um, these are sometimes abbreviated as LABA. What does that stand for? What is LABA? <laughs> Long acting. Beta agonist. Beta agonist. Yep. So long acting beta agonist. These are drugs that will last about 12 hours. Depending on the drug, they start working somewhere between two minutes and 30 minutes. But even the one that's you that starts working in two minutes is not used as a rescue inhaler. Now, if you look at the, the drug label, the drug information, the package insert for one of these drugs, there will be a what's called a black box warning, which is the highest warning level available from the FDA. And it will say, warning, use of these types of drugs in a patient with asthma may lead to increased risk of sudden death. Because there was a study that showed that patients who were on a long-acting beta agonist who had asthma were more likely to die of sudden death than the patients who weren't. And what they think happened is back then you had rescue inhaler, long-acting beta agonist. <laughs> Dead. Because they took the wrong one. The thinking is that they were taking the wrong one by accident. So. Long-acting beta agonists are never available in this. They are only available in dry powdered inhaler or discus. And that's to avoid patients taking the wrong inhaler by accident. So um, two drugs, sal well, two that we're going to talk about anyway, salmeterol and formoterol. There are a couple newer ones. I'm drawing a blank on it at the moment, but it's in a drug called Brio, which you ever watch TV, they're showing commercials for Brio all over the place. But um, anyway, salmeterol and formoterol. Salmeterol is what's in a discus, and formoterol is what's in the other version of the dry powdered inhaler that's this little tablet model, capsule model. Any questions about beta agonists? Well, salmeterol is in combination with, it's in, in the adver discus, so, yeah. So salmeterol for motorol. All right, the next thing that we have is anticholinergics. Now, coming back to our little airway here, when it comes to um, 
parasympathetic receptors. What are the parasympathetic receptors in the bronchi? What are they? What was the name of them? There's only one, so. Mu muscarinic. So you've got muscarinic receptors in the airway. When those muscarinic receptors are stimulated, what do you get? Bronchodilation? Not bronchodilation. The opposite. The opposite, which would be? bronchoconstriction and increased mucus. So remember this, acetylcholine always makes muscles contract and it always makes glands secrete. So when you activate the muscarinic receptors here, you're going to get secretion of mucus and you're going to get contraction of the muscle, so bronchoconstriction. So when we block muscarinic receptors, what do we get? we get the opposite, bronchodilation and reduced mucus. So that is fantastic for a disease characterized by bronchoconstriction and reduced muc and increased mucus. And that would be called chronic bronchitis. So the number one treatment for chronic bronchitis is anticholinergics. So drug names, you've already learned ipratropium. Ipratropium is available in combination with albuterol in an inhaler called Combivent. Combivent can be used as a rescue inhaler because it's got albuterol in it. And then it can also be found in Nebulizer. Um, the drug by itself is called Atrovent. I'm not sure if it's available by itself as an inhaler, but I think it might be. But maybe it was pulled off after they did the whole long-acting beta agonist thing. So, ipratropium. Then I'm going to tell you another one, tiotropium. Tiotropium. Oh, um, so albuterol lasts about four to six hours, and so does um, ipratropium. Tiotropium lasts much, much, much longer. And the reason I'm telling you its name is because it's what comes in this particular device right here. So in the dried powder inhaler, the handy inhaler is, this is what you get, tiotropium in. The brand name is called Spiriva. Nebulizer and inhaler, combivent, combined with um, albuterol. Now, now that I've taught you tiotropium, tiotropium, I'm going to tell you it's not on your test. <laughs> Shut up, Dr. Raymond! <laughs> yes, ma'am? Is it 12 hours? Is that how long you think? Um, I can't remember exactly how long it is offhand, but I'm sure you can look it up. Oh, we're almost done with our time. All right, so we'll, we'll go just a little bit longer to finish this up, and then we'll head out, because about 15 minutes. Um, so, ipratropium and tiotropium. Um, when these are given um, inhaled, there are very, very few adverse effects. So, even though, yes, technically you can have all the anticholinergic effects we talked about earlier in the class, you're probably not going to see them when you use them in this way. All right, the last bronchodilator um, class is called methylxanthines. Some of you guys are going to be very, um, what's the word, innovative in your misspelling of methylxanthines. <coughs> so methylxanthines are similar to caffeine. They're a stimulant like caffeine. They can be associated with heart palpitations like caffeine. They can cause high blood pressure like caffeine. But one of the things they can also do is cause bronchodilation. So these drugs are very old. They're not that effective. So they're considered what's called third line. What does third line mean? Well, your first line would be drugs like this. 
Second line might be a drug like that, or the other way around. And then third line would be, well, neither of those is working enough. Let's try something in addition. So it's not something you just start a patient on. It's something that they eventually might have to go on if nothing else is working well enough. So the drug names are theophylline and am aminophylline, aminophylline. Um, so what do you need to know about them? They're bronchodilators, they're third line, and they can cause heart palpitations. All right, that is it for bronchodilators. Any questions about bronchodilators? So on the test, chances are you might only have one question about this, whereas you might have several questions about these. And the only question I'll have about the non-selective will be about epinephrine. epinephrine. OK, so let's talk about the anti-inflammatories. All right, so for anti-inflammatories, um, the best anti-inflammatories in terms of the strongest is always going to be st steroids. Always, always, always steroids. Now, we've got two choices. We can give it either systemically or we can give it inhaled. So for systemic, usually what you're going to see is either prednisone PO or IV methylprednisolone. When a patient comes into the hospital with an exacerbation of chronic bronchitis, COPD, the drug that's going to be given almost always is going to be IV methylprednisolone. Now, when it comes to inhaled, there's a whole bunch of them. And the only one we're going to learn is fluticasone. So um, there's others. So. If, um, if you go to like Walmart or CVS, Walgreens, and you go to the nasal allergy section, you'll see nasal allergy sprays that are steroids, and you'll see um, triamcinolone, nasacort. Well, that becomes asthmacort when you breathe it in for your lungs. You'll see um, rhinocort, which is budesonide, and that becomes pulmacort when you breathe it in for your lungs. So there's a whole bunch of others. We're just not going to learn them at this time. So as a representative, we're going to learn fluticasone, which the nasal equivalent of fluticasone is Nasonex. Sorry, that is not right. That's, um, anyway, lies. Um, <laughs> let me just say that again. <laughs> the nasal version of fluticasone is Flonase. So um, the important thing when you do inhaled steroids, we've already talked about one important thing, which is which, which inhaler do you use first, the uh, bronchodilator or the anti-inflammatory? Bronchodilator. bronchodilator. So the first thing is you use your bronchodilator before you use your fluticasone. The second thing that's important is that after you take the inhaled steroid, you need to rinse your mouth out. Two adverse effects can occur if you don't. The first one is called dysphonia, which means hoarseness. So you might wake up the next day and you can't talk very well. And the other adverse effect is thrush. What is thrush? Candidiasis. Oral candidiasis, so yeast infection of the mouth. Um, as an anti-inflammatory, it can reduce your body's immune response. And if you leave it sitting on, the, on your mouth, well, that will allow yeast a chance to come up and grow where they ordinarily wouldn't be growing. So the, you can avoid both of those things most of the time by doing what? Rinse your mouth out. So generally speaking, you should rinse twice. First one, you rinse and spit. Whatever was in your mouth is now out of your mouth. The second, you rinse and swallow. Why would you rinse and swallow? Because some of it's in your esophagus. And by rinsing it, it goes down into your stomach. So that way, you don't get thrush in your esophagus. Um, 
Most of the adverse effects when it comes to inhaled steroids comes from anytime you inhale a drug, some of it goes into your stomach too. And then it gets absorbed locally. Um, how, many, how many smokers do we have in the class? How many have ever tried smoking before? Well, the, the first time a person smokes, typically what happens is they go, because oh! they burn their throat, because they, they sucked in too hard. And then they learn how not to do that, and then they feel sick to their stomach because half of the smoke went into their stomach. So when you inhale, it, it takes work to learn how to inhale correctly. So when you inhale a drug, some of that drug is going into your stomach, and that's where most of the adverse effects are coming from, is it's being absorbed systemically. Um, that's it for fluticasone. Any questions? All right, next we have leukotriene inhibitors. Do you notice how we're going faster? You want to know why that is? No, it's because we've already learned all about steroids, which means that any question about steroids is fair game. Oh, man. So we're not going to entire re-lecture that part. I just expect you to go back and review it. And, or Hey, don't review it. Just know it. No, OK, review it. That's how you remember it. Um, so leukotriene inhibitors. Now, does this look familiar? Arachidonic acid becomes prostaglandins through cyclooxygenase, right? Well, if you give it yet another enzyme, it'll become leukotriene. What's the name for an inflammatory mediator that changes the behavior of other cells? Oh, a, cytokine. a cytokine. Leukotriene is an inflammatory cytokine. It's very, very much associated with um, respiratory inflammation. So by inhibiting leukotrienes, you can reduce the amount of respiratory inflammation that you have. Now, when a mast cell degranulates, how many substances are released? When a mast cell degranulates, how many substances are released? At least 17. So targeting just leukotriene turns out it doesn't really work that well. Some patients it works pretty well for, but most patients are like, meh, didn't do much. Um, so there's several different drugs. Some of them inhibit the enzyme. Others block leukotriene receptors. But in the end, they both have the, the effect of reducing leukotriene activity. The most effective one is the one we're going to learn, and that is Montelicast. Also known as singular. Get it? It's like singular, but it's singular. Oh man, that's so clever. Anyone here ever been on singular? I think I have. Did it work for you? When I was younger, I can't remember. Can't remember? Right. Yeah, a lot of patients are like, nah, I can't, I'm not sure. It might work. Yeah. So usually Singular is not the drug that a patient's going to be on by itself, but it might be a drug they're on in addition. Now, the third type of anti-inflammatory is a drug that works so poorly, I don't even like to talk about it, but for whatever reason, they like to put it on standardized tests. And that is uh, mast cell stabilizers. The whole idea is that by stabilizing a mast cell, you won't have as many allergic reactions, so therefore you'll have fewer asthma attacks. Um, they don't really work very well at all, but they can be used sometimes for exercise-induced asthma. For some reason, in some patients, exercise causes an asthma attack. And you can use those kinds of drugs to prevent. When's, when would you take the mast cell stabilizer to prevent exercise-induced asthma? Before. Before you exercise. So the drug name there is chromalin. And that's all you really need to know about chromalin. Doesn't work very well at all, except maybe for some patients who have exercise-induced asthma. All right, on that note, we have covered all the respiratory drugs except for cough suppressants. Um, so opioids are your strongest cough suppressant.
The two drugs that are typically used for that, codeine and hydrocodone. Next, you have um, dextromethorphan, which is abbreviated DM. So dextromethorphan. This is available over the counter. And anytime you see a drug that ends in DM at the drugstore, it's got dextromethorphan in it. So Robitussin, DM. Mucinex, DM. What's the DM stand for? Dextromethorphan. Uh, it works pretty well, but a lot, of the a lot of the drugs that you get over the counter don't have a very high dose. So you kind of have to take a higher dose to get a really good effect. If you take a really high dose, it kind of makes you drowsy. It may maybe feel weird. So sometimes kids, you know, buy bottles of the stuff and chug it trying to get high. So just so now they're like, oh, maybe we need to ban methorphan, make it a controlled substance. Like it doesn't make you high. It's just kids will try anything when you don't let them get the ganja. Anyway, um, never mind. That's a whole other story. But you know. Kids will try almost anything to get high for some reason, but it doesn't mean that the substance is dangerous or addictive or needs to be banned. So just say no to banning drugs that don't need to be banned. That's what I say. Um, so anyway, dextromethorphan. One thing to note about dextromethorphan is it goes through the CYP2D6 microsomal enzyme system. <laughs> Do you remember what that means? The cytochrome P450 microsomal enzyme system. So the CYP2D6 subsystem has a lot of other drugs that go with it. So one of the things to be aware of, especially if you go on to become a nurse practitioner, is anytime you give dextromethorphan or you have a patient with a cold, the dextromethorphan has a lot of potential interactions with other drugs. All right, the last one. The last one is called benzonitate. And the brand name is Tessalon, sometimes called Tessalon pearls, because they look like little translucent pearls, although they're yellow, not pearly, whatever. Um, so this is a local anesthetic that numbs the cough receptors in your stomach. Yes, you have cough receptors in your stomach. The important thing is they should not be crushed or chewed. They need to be swallowed whole. Any questions about Teslon pearls? All right, and the very, very last thing is expectorants. <coughs> An expectorant is a drug that helps you cough something up. None of them are very effective. The most effective one is called guaifenesin, which is available over the counter. So if you take a drug like Robitussin or um, Mucinex, the major ingredient in it will be guaifenesin. And if it's the DM version, it'll have guaifenesin plus dextromethorphan. And the idea there is you cough less, but when you do cough, you cough something up. Um, guaifenesin doesn't really work unless you have the patient hydrate adequately, but guess what is probably one of the best expectorants there is? Hydrating adequately. So some people say, well, it doesn't really work, but if it's a magic feather that gets them to drink more water, okay, take the drug. You know what else works pretty well? Go in the shower and breathe in the mist. Also hydrating. All right, on that note, we are done with respiratory drugs, and next time we're going to start off with um, the second packet of, of um, respiratory disease notes, the ones that starts off with ARDS. All right, see you guys next week. Yeah, I know. Is that not part of the combination? Brio is a combination, but I haven't made you guys memorize it yet. I just mentioned it in class, but I didn't go over it. Yeah. After I said it. <laughs> nah, it's all right. If you want to learn it, you can learn it. And I'll put it on your test. <laughs> it's just for you. All right. See you guys next time. Sorry.